Good evening. Welcome back to the channel. My name is Rogan Marshall. It is 1987 we're going to discuss, and Stanley Kubrick's Full Metal Jacket. This is uh, take two. Man, I'm in Ohio. I'm in Lima, Ohio, sometimes referred to as Labyrinthium. Uh, sort of north, sort of west. The nearest big city is Columbus or Detroit, depending on which direction you leave here from. Um, it's a little chilly today. Uh, I lived in Florida for like 10 or 15 years. I don't know what I count as living. Uh, I I forgot that having a runny nose is a thing. <laughs> like, I, I have paper towels here I used to blow my nose. Um, I just did a take of this talking about Full Metal Jacket. I, I don't know, about 10 minutes in, I realized, like, I can't keep talking. Snot is just going to fall out of my nose. Like, I, if it happens again, now I've prepared myself and you for this eventuality, I, I will just put my face off screen and blow my nose. Uh, wait, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Yeah, yeah, I had to blow my nose. <laughs> um, Full Metal Jacket, 1987. Um, Stanley Kubrick. This is the third video I've uh, been forced by my methodology and my little lists to make about a Stanley Kubrick movie in rapid succession. And, and they're, I think, his three best movies. They're not my three favorites. Uh, I guess Clockwork Orange in 2001 or Flashier. I, you know, Lolita, Pads of Glory. Uh, these are all great movies. Um, it's I don't even think in terms of my favorite Stanley Kubrick movie normally because there there's just so many... Uh, outright wild-eyed masterpieces um full metal jacket if you haven't seen it is a vietnam war drama based on a memoir well a novel that's a memoir <clears throat> called the short timers i've heard it's really good i've never read it i've heard the movie's a pretty faithful adaptation of it um i don't think it's even stanley kubrick's best war movie for one thing uh paths of glory I, with kirk douglas is it's got a screenplay by jim thompson it's pretty pretty amazing movie uh in fact, Paths of Glory is the Stanley Kubrick movie that actually is not uh, so Stanley Kubrick that it's kind of half disappeared up his own ass in terms of style and form. Like, if you don't love Stanley Kubrick just for vibe, like if his vibe rubs you the wrong way, Paths of Glory is going to be the one that you actually like. Um, hello, Zoe. Would you like to come join the video? You've been sickly and... Yeah, yeah, the folks would like to, no? You're going to keep trying to crawl into a grocery bag? All right, knock yourself out. It's okay for her to play with plastic bags. She's being supervised, and frankly, you can't entirely stop her. She loves plastic. Um, where was I? Uh... Getting up and taking the bags away from Zoe. Um, so Full Metal Jacket, right. Uh, the way that Kubrick was obsessive, the first take I... I oh, I see what you're doing. Yeah, you can't lie on that. It's, just, it's a plastic bag, dude. They're dangerous. Bad, bad, bad. Um, so for uh, the first one of these uh, uh, takes of this here uh, video about Full Metal Jacket... I talked for about 10 minutes about the photography, got sidetracked talking in detail about the strange cameras that Stanley Kubrick used, which he owned himself. Uh, and he talks about that in the documentary that came with a box set that came out right when he died with eyes wide shut. I think the documentary is called Stanley Kubrick, a life in pictures. Uh, it's, it's not a real movie. It's just interviews they did for the DVD extra features cut together for an entire two hour feature. Uh, it's but there's a lot of interesting information in it, of course, uh, and interviews. Um, here's something that's interesting about how obsessive Kubrick was about the details with the photography. Um, I used to have a TV, a rear projection TV. I can't remember who the I can't remember who the manufacturer was. I'm not enough of a tech geek, but I, I had this specific rear projection TV for for a number of reasons. One, uh, I was. I actually, uh, I think the rear projection image just looks so much better than any of the uh, the current and uh, really, I guess, two or three generations now of HD home 
video technology. Those rear projection TVs that were sort of right at the edge of everything converting to, to HD. I really liked mine. I really liked the way the image looked. And there were a couple of other little features that I liked. And one of them was that I could toggle back and forth between the framing on a video. So when Stanley Kubrick shot his last three movies, uh, he he was a little obsessed with, I mean, he was obsessed with all the detailing on everything, but he was obsessed with controlling the uh, the image, the aspect ratio, making sure we, we didn't see things we weren't supposed to see or parts of the image weren't cropped out for television. And so um, the home video versions in the VHS era of all these later Kubrick movies are Academy ratio, like this, right? It's kind of square. It's kind of the shape of a TV image. It's Academy ratio. And the, all the old movies are Academy ratio because they invented widescreen, blowing the edges of that out, to compete with home video that is television, to compete with broadcast television. Uh, going to the movies, the numbers were dropping like mad the beginning of the 50s as television became a typical household appliance and you could watch old movies on tv so to get people back out to the new movies they started trying things like uh cinemascope and widescreen generally like the ratio that you're seeing like whatever this is 185 the normal widescreen ratio that's standard for everything now 16 by 9 185 1 i don't know i i'm not solid on these numbers and what they mean um but uh the way you arrived at that in an old movie, uh, if you'll follow me, and it's a little weird, the reason the shape of the image was for Academy ratios like this is because it's basically the shape of the image coming off the 35 film. So to create a widescreen image, you just crop it down, meaning there's more information in the original film negative. There's some stuff at the top and some stuff at the bottom that you trimmed out to get your widescreen image. And if it's CinemaScope and it's super widescreen, you actually trimmed out more. So although in, in terms of comparing the final image of a movie, in theory, a widescreen image, right? Because you adjust to the movie screen. So like it, it's, it's counterintuitive, right? The Academy ratio feels like, well, it must be smaller because it's smaller. No, no. Actually, the the widescreen image is smaller. It embeds in the Academy Ratio image. Uh, I know it's weird. Um, so Kubrick, to control that, so they couldn't take away his control over what was in the image and what wasn't. That there wouldn't be trimming this way or this way. Uh, he just shot for Academy Ratio for home video for all his movies, right? Full Metal Jacket, The Shining, and Eyes Wide Shut on home video, it was always full frame. And you understood, that if you hadn't seen it in a theater, you wouldn't get to see it this way, but you understood that the theatrical versions of the Kubrick movies, when they premiered in theaters, were actually cropped down for widescreen. Now, during this era, British movies and the British ratio was slightly different. If you're a tech nerd about movies, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. I think that aspect ratio is 166.1. So it's like this. Academy ratio, right, is about like, like this. That's old movies, TV shows, before widescreen, before the modern era. This out here, right, is normal widescreen now. For decades, the British aspect ratio and the European aspect ratio was in between, about here. There's a subtle difference. If you went to see a lot of foreign movies, your eye was used to catching that difference because uh, it wasn't just British movies or that other aspect ratio. I think like all European movies or a lot of them were. I remember French movies being in that aspect ratio, the 166 one. Uh, the movie theater where I saw a lot of movies growing up in Cincinnati was called The Movies. It was on... Uh, divine a race in downtown Cincinnati. I haunted the place like a ghost, uh, like a phantom. And uh, I saw three or four movies there a week when I was a teenager. But they uh, would open their curtains at the beginning of each show, like each big 
play multiple different movies a day. So the curtains like mechanically squeak, 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 squeak would close over the screen and the light, house lights would come up, movie would end. And then when a movie's going to start, they're bringing the people in and the house lights would come down and, uh, they, and usually they play a preview reel. And then the curtains would move to where they were going to be for the movie. And that would be your indication of how widescreen the movie was, right? So it would be like here for Academy. But if the curtains opened way out, you would be like, oh, cool, it's CinemaScope. Or like one of the widescreen things that's like CinemaScope, super widescreen. Um, <clears throat> got sidetracked a little bit. So, okay, so there's three different standard versions of standard movies, if you follow so far. There's the one that's like what you're looking at now, which is how things would play theatrically. There's Academy Ratio, which things would get cropped down to for TV. Or if you're Stanley Kubrick, you go back to the master and you master from the original negative to get the Academy Ratio for home video. And there's a middle one, right? So this TV I had, this rear projection TV, you could toggle between the three. You could set your screen to be either 185 one widescreen or Academy Ratio, or and, and if you had an Academy Ratio input and you set it for widescreen, you could crop it down yourself. And you could also set it for the British one, which like would crop it down a little bit less to hit the British mark, right? So the Academy Ratio is here. It crops to about here for British, crops to about here for standard widescreen, and I could toggle between the three and trim out tops and bottoms of my own. Like, at one point, I got out bootlegs of my old student films on VHS that we made, Jeremy and I made at Emerson, and I cropped those down to see what they would look like if they were. We didn't frame for widescreen, though. We weren't thinking about designing for widescreen, so it's just kind of random what's missing. But on a Stanley Kubrick movie? So once I, I realized I could like adjust between what played theatrically and what, you know, crop it down to widescreen. Cause at that time, this was at the beginning of the DVD era, right? The early DVDs of the Kubrick movies, they weren't cropped for widescreen. You like had to watch, watch the Academy ratio all the way out. Right. So you couldn't actually see the theatrical version. If you wanted to fuss about it, you could see all the information, but it wasn't cropped. Right. Right. So, so the day I realized that, that I could fix that. I got excited and I got the shining out and uh, full metal jacket. Now, Eyes Wide Shut, I don't think I ever had a VHS copy of that. I think that was DVD era. So it may just be those two movies that I tested this with. And in my memory, Eyes Wide Shut is included. Um, I don't remember though. Maybe Eyes Wide Shut also was mastered for home video for Academy Ratio originally. Uh, I don't remember. But Full Metal Jacket and The Shining, I remember checking. Um, because what I found when I toggled between the three aspect ratios was there were all these little things in the design that made it clear that it was designed to work perfectly in slightly different ways for all three aspect ratios. And like there were little things to make it clearer that they knew somebody would be looking at this and they were letting me know that they knew that I knew that they knew. Like the the shots would like, he, Kubrick's really obsessed with sort of architecture. There's lots of right angles all over stuff. There, It's boxy rooms and doorways and rooms and doorways and arches and just, you know, those cross pieces. He's he's uses those to, to corner shots so that in every shot in both of those movies, uh, there's little things to let you know the design was conscious of all three different aspect ratios. Like they, when they were running it and setting it up, they made sure it would, it would hit slightly different marks that were cool in slightly different ways for all three of those aspect ratios. And you can see clearly that it was conscious. And I, I, like, I didn't watch the whole movie toggling back and forth, but I watched five minutes. I watched five minutes. I checked both movies and I was like, holy shit, that is an insane level of attention to detail. And of course, like, it's not impossible. Like it's just sometimes when you, you talk to people about filmmaking and they're like, how could anyone possibly give that much attention to that kind of detail? Like they're not thinking about how much attention you're paying and watching it once. But remember when they're standing there, they're, they're standing there. There's like 20 smart people and another 20 who are their assistants and helpers 
rigging the lights and everything else you got to do to shoot a movie. And uh, all of those people are smart if you make sure they're smart. All of them can contribute creatively. And if you want them to be this this obsessively detail oriented with the photography, well, they can be. Sometimes you got to encourage it a little bit. Sometimes you got to discourage sloppiness. You got to get rid of those people. Uh, Stanley Kubrick movies you always heard were like weird, like he'd have a closed set, like so nobody could just wander in to be invited and have a guard out front. But once you got inside, it was like, yeah, this, there's celebrity actors, but yeah, it's mainly like, it's like 10 people. There aren't a whole bunch of gophers. There isn't a whole bunch of running around activity that a lot of what Stanley Kubrick did by working in England and working sort of outside Hollywood is distance himself from this weird need to rush everything. And so they would really obsess over how they hung lights and how they framed shots and how they moved the camera on Kubrick movies. And, uh, you know, it's very technical. Like you, you don't, even if you're a filmmaker with a filmmaker's eye, the, the level of detail in a Kubrick movie does not necessarily leap forward and leap out until you start examining closely. Uh, but the closer you look, the more attention to detail there is everywhere. Um, yeah, Full Metal Jacket. Another one I heard about Full Metal Jacket back in the day was that Stanley Kubrick, like, okay, so the soundtrack to Full Metal Jacket, right, is a bunch of weird sort of industrial noise music, some military march stuff, and five or six, uh, you know, era pop songs, like Paint It Black by the Stones over the end credits is pretty famous. Uh, These Boots by Nancy Sinatra is in it. Uh, so I read somewhere at the time or in a later interview uh, or article about it that uh, Stanley Kubrick paid a DJ in the United States. Remember, this is pre-internet. So if you wanted this, you couldn't just do it yourself. Stanley Kubrick paid a guy at a radio station to uh, play for him every hit single that charted with Billboard as a, a rock and roll radio hit during the exact era of the Vietnam War from 65 to 75. Um, and which is, and what's funny about that is he, with that level of attention to detail, that, that opening song, uh, hello Vietnam. I don't know who, who does that, but I mean, did you really need to put that much time and energy and money and attention into that to arrive at paint it black over the end credits surfing bird by the trash man? Like you, you made a reference to pink flamingos and the way you used it. So like, you didn't even need somebody to play you that you knew it from pink flamingos. So like, but all right. All right. You know? Uh, thing about being obsessive compulsive. Well, no, that's not obsessive compulsive, ob obsessive, detail oriented, thorough like that with this kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if Stanley Kubrick had any interest in ceremonial magic. Uh, I do. And, uh, one of the things you learn from studying ceremonial magic is that this kind of attention on an artistic project is if deployed correctly, its own reward. Your audience can sense how much attention, how much sustained attention you brought to bear on it. Uh, practicing music can be like that too. Uh, you can write something simple, but if you play it a thousand times for 12 hours straight until your fingers are literally bleeding, like you can hear that in the way you play that for the rest of the times you play it throughout your life. Um, and, uh, and so this kind of obsessive detail fixation yeah, there's uh, there's reasons, there's psychological reasons that that sort of sort of uh, have to do with the collective unconscious, the connections between us all that are uh, invisible to the eye, uh, but not uh, to that with which we sense great stories. Um, yeah, nineteen minutes. I didn't even talk about that. I mean, there's so much to talk about with Kubrick. Uh, should I live long enough to circle all the way back around and talk about Full Metal Jacket some more? I'll have more to say because I didn't even run out of the things I wanted to say today.